I want to welcome MBJ. Uh, they are here to talk to us about integrated modeling and detailing. It's essentially the idea of extending uh, services and the shop drying process is how I oversimplify it through the structural engineers to gain some efficiencies and stuff. I know we've done it a couple times uh, here in the past, but it is an evolving process. And these guys will walk through when and how to use it, and it may be different than the same story you got two years ago. So with that, I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Jason Peterson, and I'm associate principal of Meyer Boardman Johnson. I'm going to introduce my colleague, Jerry Hoffman, principal. Session. We have Tony Pelusny, principal, and he's managing our Phoenix office up in Phoenix today. Don't know why he was coming. Terrible And Brian Zouet, associate principal colleague. Um, I was trying to think of an introduction to our talk today. We had a recent experience at our office where some of my staff's kids who are in high school came to present something they're working on. They're in a robotics competition. You may have kids that are doing this too, but apparently it's a varsity sport. So they came in, three of them to talk about the process of how they get the robotic kit and they put it together and then they compete. And one of the kids said, what we do is exactly what you guys do. We work with a budget, we work with a schedule, but we still have to build something awesome. <laughs> and I got to thinking, it's like, well, uh, and we all struggle like that too, but it's really not much different than what we're being asked to deliver, particularly with these financial plans. We have to build things faster, we have to build things at a competitive cost, but we still have to create things that have quality. So the process that we're going to introduce today speaks to how we can take processes that we do from design and actually drive them through the construction process in a very lean way and in a way that we describe sometimes as direct to fabricator. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jared and he can talk more about specifics. Thanks, Jason. And I don't know if any of you were here three years ago, actually, that we gave a similar presentation. And as I would say, that's more focused on this is what we can do. Today, this is focused more of this is what we've done in the last three years. So um, as you'll see, it's not that one size fits all jobs, that it's really functional what jobs you have, what the needs of the job are. And so we'll hit a, a wide variety of service types. So I think most of you know who Meyer Boardman Johnson is, or MBJ, if we'd like to go by shorter. But uh, we have offices in Minneapolis, Duluth, Green Bay, and Phoenix. And then this map is just kind of showing it's almost all filled in except for a couple of states that we're licensed throughout the United States and, and Hawaii. Um, we've had a long range of experience with, with Ryan companies, uh, a lot of different project types. Um, and this shows an example of, of a number of them. So in our Phoenix office, the Musical Instrument Museum up here on top right, uh, Tony and Jason both played a large part in that project. Um, the GSA office building, which we'll talk about as an example of this integrated steel process today, again in our Phoenix office. And then the other ones are Minnesota-based from um, Historic Renovations, and, uh, Adaptive Reuse, Poche, um, another hotel, then the recent 222 project is being constructed right now. So we've had a lot of strong relationships, um, both in the Midwest and in the Southwest. Uh, and so our goal is to, to bring um, the opportunity that we might be seeing on either office uh, to the rest of the offices and bring awareness to it. Uh, this is something I like to call uh, pre-BIM or before BIM. Uh, this is at the beginning of my career. We did a project that had a very interesting 3D geometry. Uh, so back in 1997, I was building this model in an in in analysis program, and we also were putting in 3D AutoCAD, where we we're identifying the top center line of the steel beams. But we're not trying to extrude all the steel beam shapes. And when it went to go to um, the steel fabricator. We did the normal, we gave them the design drawings, we gave them coordinates points, and then, then we, we had a release form, we said here you can have our digital model, but we're not taking responsibility for it. So you've seen a lot of that. Um, and, and we know they went ahead with all these different beams, they, they took our model and ran with it. And so this is what we call pre-BIM before we're calling it BIM, or integrated process.
I think a lot of you may think of Meyer Borden and Johnson as a structural design firm that we put out the construction documents. And that's what we do a lot of, us. we are engineer record. Um, but in the years past, recent years, we've been focusing more on going downstream. And so we've been developing partnerships uh, toward the subcontractor market so that we can go from design down to detailing. And so in between there, we call this uh, a lot of different things, integrated construction, modeling, and detailing. Um, going from the engineer record down to the subcontractor and giving them a product that works. And so in, in basic terms, um, we can do the engineer record. We can do the detailing and modeling for the sub. We can do all those and deliver a product. Or um, maybe we're not the engineer record. A number of examples I'm going to show you today, MEJ was not the engineer record. There's a team on the project, they're moving forward, but maybe they needed some help in some ways to move it faster um, or have better coordination and they didn't have the skill set. So we jumped in as a, like an IPD engineer. Um, so not just as a doing shop runs and detailing, but bringing the engineer side and our know-how of how things should be put together into this role. By the way, feel free to stop and ask questions throughout the whole thing. So there's a lot of different ways to set up contracts. Um, this is traditional maybe hard bid, where you have the owner and on one side you have the architect and the design team. On the other side you have the GC and all the subs. There's design. Um, design build, there's some level of IP going on in the phase. So this is traditional. As you can see there, just showing that between the structural engineer and where our product ends up getting detailed for shop drawings, there, there's a big separation. Usually, after the design document, we'll put all the spots, I'll come back through here, and we'll go back through here, and back and forth. So there, there's quite a bit of separation. So what we've been focusing on is the lower arrangement down here, where we start taking on the role as the detailer and, and doing the model at a fabrication level and the shop drawings. And so we already have examples of you today where we've done that mostly for structural steel. So we'll show you light gauge steel and some of the other uh, rebar and whatnot that we've been So, and, and Mike Warner and Johnson, I guess we're, we're, we feel that we're not just structural engineers. We need to understand the whole full scope of the project for its value. And so we're, we continue to try to broaden ourselves and bring the skill sets, not just to the engineers, but also the detailers and construction managers. So not that we're going to take over the role, your role, but we should understand it well enough how, how to bring value to the team. And bringing those skill sets together is what we're calling integrated modeling and detailing. We're not going to sit back and wait for the questions to be asked, but we're going to be proactive. In fact, I, I call us the catalyst in a lot of conditions. We're going to really push the process hard for speed and coordination. Hopefully this brings a bell to everybody that design bill doesn't equal construction bill. Put in other terms, there's a lot of coordination that happens in BIM modeling with the architect, structural engineer, mechanical. Um, it's design intent, it's to, to a certain level. It might be the people are trying to get it exactly right dimensionally, but if something's off by an inch or something, it may not be the end of the world because they're not expecting to push a button and for it to get fabricated. On the other end, um, yeah. So um, a lot of the design tools that we use, um, the design side, Revit, obviously primarily, you know, as Jared mentioned, it's kind of design intent, but we're going through an iterative design process. So the model is developing and being coordinated as we're going through the design. And the traditional process, we've taken that to the point in which then that model can be maybe perhaps delivered, right? Um, uh, you might put it into a Navisports model and coordinate. But we're not necessarily taking complete information and working upstream with it. We're taking information that is evolving, <coughs> developing, iterating. And we're saying, well, do we deliver it or not? And so that's where I think there's been a, a wall in the past, a hurdle, that the design intent, all the good work you do to model that, at best, sometimes you just go into a 
Navis Word Flash Detector Mic tool, and then you hope for the best. And what we're trying to do is inform the process early so that if we're working back up in the construction bin process, which Jerry's going to describe, that that's, that's informing the process along the way, so you're working to that middle ground together. Thank you. So construction bin, if you think about steel, steel shop drawings and the model that goes with it, the mechanical systems, the mechanical subs, these days I can probably have produced in a number of 3D models, and, and a number of them may go right, right to their CNC machines, right to their fabrication lines. That's, that's construction bin. And so there's a different focus currently on the two, and what you really need to understand is two differences, and, and that's what we've been doing over the last three or four years. So when we get involved in construction band and downstream service, we have a few rules of engagement. Um, number one is we're going to identify and leverage opportunities project by project, so it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, the whole goal is to make it a lean process, remove steps. Um, I often say if, if you could have shop drawings, if I go to that in the future, all your shop drawings will never be marked with items you submit. I think that brings comfort to you. Our, our process is that we push, take out the possibility of revising the piece of um, Do not reduce competitiveness. We need to keep a, a strong competitive field out there in the subcontractor market. Our goal, our goal is to understand where people are competitive in different areas and work with it, not against it. So we're not going to step on people's toes in that area. And this is a big one, not to pass models to subcontractors that really don't work. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of times from subcontractors that, yeah, the design team gave me a model, but it, it was off, it didn't work, we had to throw it out and start over, right? Has everybody heard that? There's something close to that. Um, we're not going to say that we can deliver a model to a subcontractor that works unless we can do it. And so. I'll show you some strategies that we use to improve that. We're going to look at five different services today with real project examples for each. Um, and I'll just go through them as we get into them. So number one is engineer a record and integrate detailing. So this is where the previous slide where the engineer a record all the way down to subcontractor. This is probably the best situation we think for opportunities. Um, may have slight bias there, but we say it bring a lot of value. Next couple of slides here are Phoenix based projects, so I'm going to hand over the presentation. Hey, sorry. Uh, some of you might recognize this one that finished up last year in the GSA Phoenix office building. Um, why this is important is you know, this was a, a design competition with client companies. Uh, to win the project, and we were all fortunate enough to win this project, but it was a very lean feat going into it. And as a team, what I really admired about running companies is they opened it up and just said, how do we get this fee down? How do we get our price down and make this a profitable uh, project for all of us? And part of this process was that, you know, from the structural point of view, said, one of the things we'd want to be able to do is maybe get some uh, tighter numbers, take out complexity, take out uh, different steps in the procurement process that might, you know, leave your contingency a little bit larger than maybe it should be or could be. And so, working with my companies, we worked up a strategy where we would develop uh, the sticks only model, which is kind of what you see on the right hand side here, it is a Tecla model, but it didn't have connections all the bolting or the weld plates or the miscellaneous attached groups on there. And we handed that off directly to three fabricators at that time, Triad, Able, and Shuff. We worked with Shuff quite a bit. We worked with Triad occasionally here and there. We had never worked with Able steel fabricators in the Phoenix market before. Part of the process to identify this was also to hand over a contract that when the fabricator gets selected in their bid, they need to be able to say that they would take on the contract of shop drawings from Meyer Boardman Johnson. That's how we dealt with kind of the risk in that situation, is that we can build a contract and the fabricator would take it. Having Eagle Steel, you know, kind of unknown to us, we had to sit down in a room and talk over about how our process really occurred uh, in this procurement process and how it would benefit them and how they use their 
specific connection material and other uh, jig setups and that what um, uh, software format they need to have the mill order put into and uh, put into their fabrication system. So we worked through all of that. We obviously came up with a winning bid in this process and we were able to deliver the mill order the first day, one day after they signed the contract that we were actually were selected. And we were able to move on then into the shop running process. Immediately that day, for their system of bolting, weld plates, et cetera, in the system. And from all in all in this process, steel ended up uh, erected 54 days ahead of schedule on the system. Uh, it's pretty impressive when you look at what you know, we started the project on the team as a whole of the price and trying to figure out different ways to lean up that process. And so we think that this is, and I think Ryan companies completely agree, that this was an ideal situation that we all came out of <coughs> an ideal situation. Those all projects were delivered to GSA on time, two months ahead of schedule, which is kind of unheard of for GSA projects. And you guys made a very good impression with GSA because of this project. Uh, BHP Copper Mine. Um, this is a, a, a really fun and interesting process here. We were hired, uh, BHP is out in uh, the East Valley, uh, about <coughs> 75 miles uh, east of Phoenix. And we were hired to look at all of the buildings, 46 buildings for their condition service. They wanted to restart this mine, which hasn't been open since 96, 97. Um, so we had to identify all the structural deficiencies in this process. And if they were going to restart the mine, which they wouldn't tell us till uh, February 2012, we finished our investigation in December of 2011, they had to open by October 2012, six months. And part of this process, it's a $192 million um, restart project. When they announced it in February, they said go, how do we get there in six months? Part of the process that we delivered was that we modeled everything from a steel fabricator's point of view and provided shop drawings on not everything, but all the critical path items for ore production. And so we were able to issue shop drawings fabrication level to three different fabricators in this process to procure the steel and get it on site in a way that they could continue and meet their opening in October. And uh, they did open and start actually digging dirt and, and actually um, making some money in the, in the copper business here in October. Uh, not as much production as they wanted to do. Uh, that's actually kicking up uh, here in January. But we did our job in that six months. And contract wise, for just to kind of give you a scale, um, 22 structural engineers over six months. Uh, over a million dollars in structural fees, just to kind of put it out there. Um, and a lot of uh, complexity uh, that has been simplified in the delivery path. We made a process, a procurement process, with the contractor and the owner, such that it funneled through a director of three people for procurement and steel. Those three people were in charge of it. And those None of those three people were directly technical, engineers or other people. They're really about process. And when you put specific um, goals in mind early and you work as a team to hit the goals uh, and utilize the tools you have, you can end up in a very, let's just say, speed to market profitable situation. It did for this owner. Jared, can talk about this one. something on this project. So this project, we did not take away the competitiveness of the steel, free steel fabricator, but we brought speed to the equation. And, and the fabricator that ended up getting it, we had never worked with them before. <coughs> so I know there's concerns. I've, I've read uh, memos and things like that about fabricators saying why, why these processes don't work, why they take away competitiveness. We're not, we're not saying um, that you have to go in and say you have to do a clip angle or a single shear tab. We're not going to specify what has to be the connection material until the fabricator's on board to work with their system. Um, and since then, this particular fabricator at Able Steel at a Phoenix area, 
they have continually worked with us on any project they've had the opportunity to work with the MEJ and our skill detail department, which we haven't talked about yet today. Um, but they continue to come back to us. So it's just an example of, you know, the boogeyman in the room, and uh, this is so bad for steel fabricators, the fabricators choosing to work with us. And this is the same thing that's happened locally with Lejeune Steel as well, them seeing the value of it and, and choosing an integrated team. Um, we, we've developed, and, and the last presentation we gave three years ago, we focused more on this, but we've developed a working relationship with a local steel detailer. They're out of La Crosse, Wisconsin. They're called La Crosse Technical Consultants, or LTC. And so we've been work, working strategically with them for the last four years and developing these processes. So what we do, instead of trying to figure out how to do steel detailing ourselves as the engineer, we go leverage a partner and create a relationship with them. So that's what allows us to deliver a product to the fabricator that actually works. Um, we're not exclusive with them, um, but uh, we have a strong working relationship that makes sense a lot of times. So here's another project example. I, this is under the engineer record category, um, and I'll explain it a little bit. This this tower is about 100 to 150 feet tall. There's actually 26 different types of towers. Um, they're not very familiar um, structures to us here. They're called wind catchers um, or wind towers in Saudi Arabia in the desert. And what they're using for is within uh, courtyard situations, like yeah, this is a large college campus. The diesel stick up uh, the vent and draw air from above the surrounding buildings and just bring air down into the courtyard area at a low velocity and circulate air kind of passively. So what we were given uh, with, with our client was the geometry of how it works from a wind tunnel testing perspective and then basically it just make it work from a structural steel standpoint. So all this we modeled, it's hard to tell everything, but we modeled structural steel, um, gauge, plate material, uh, metal deck, all the connections, and then we brought in the things like the motors and, and things like that. We, we detailed the, uh, the walkways and fully coordinated this in a model that was like, you know, 10 pounds within a 5 pound can. It barely, it wasn't fit in there very well, but through coordination effort, we were able to do this. Uh, this is an international project that we designed here. A piece of this had to be fabricated as rotating portion in the U.S. and then shipped there, so we had to design a place for it. So this is an example where we design all inners and we detail it through shop drawings, and it, and it truly was a seamless process. Here's a construction photo of what this looks like. This is before the rest of the vents were in there. It's just catwalk and the perimeter steel. This is what it looked like there. You can see it for some people down here. So get a sense of the height. They're about 15 foot square. Um, so I talked to you about just a minute ago about LTC, La Crosse Technical Consultants. Well, within the last year, we went a step further. Um, from a steel detailing standpoint, um, the competition that continues to move um, offshore and global, it's really hard to compete to be a US only detailer, steel detailer. So our steel detailing partner was um, looking to open off uh, offshore office. And as they did with that, we hooked our boat to them uh, and became a partner in a company called Triton Tech. Triton Tech is in the Philippines, uh, in Cebu, in Manila. And we currently have about six engineers there and about 20 steel detailers. The engineers are focused solely on steel connection design and coordination within the detailing model. So they're not doing the engineer record work that we're doing here. Uh, in fact, they're doing a lot of the work that I had trouble finding people to do the work here. Um, the level of interest was really low. People would get burned out. And so this is just one more component. This provides capacity uh, and kind of the 24-7 uh, operations that's often needed for a detailing. So the next service is uh, digital steel joist procurement. Uh, I think as you all know that uh, two joists by two different manufacturers aren't exactly the same. They can carry the same load, they have the same depth, 
you can specify the bearing depth, but the innards are whatever they choose to make them because they're just following, you know, a, a requirement to design for the load. So these are truly three different joists. I don't know if they're 28 LH or whatever, but three different manufacturers, Bullcraft, Can-Am, and New Millennium. We did a test case with them. And this is what it came back out as. And so to try to do some coordination like within the webs, putting ductwork through there is impossible until you know who's being chosen. Um, for that reason, and just because of the process for joist shop drawings, you're probably familiar, just you can see long, and um, the, usually the first set of shop drawings you get for a joist, it's usually kind of the verify everything before we do anything. Verify dimensions, verify bearing, stuff. It can take a long time. So on the left side is kind of the traditional process. We won't go through all the steps, but it's back and forth because of this verification process in the shop drawings. The engineer you see the shop drawings twice because nothing gets designed until you send back the first set. We developed the process and um, showed it on uh, a webinar on Steel Day um, a couple years ago. That takes out a, a full step in there and makes it a digitally oriented process. So we, from, we have the structural steel detailing figured out. We've coordinated with um, joist manufacturers so we can give them the model and everything in the model they can use uh, as is. They don't ask to ask for it to be verified anymore. And then yeah, they want to comment about that too because yep. a lot of the, this, this is a joist, steel joist is a delegated design submittal. So they're responsible by contract to design this component part. We as a structural engineer of record are responsible for the entire kit of parts going together. And when they uh, receive this information, part of that delay in the process is simply the fact that they need to verify everything and under the sun to make sure that they've managed their risk and what they're delivering for their design. They won't even start designing until three steps are, have been taken. If they receive model content that they can run with, then the design can happen on day one. And that's really the, the collapse that, that was Yep, so that's the collapse and schedule, and here's here's just the process. <coughs> our control and building model, or our construction bin model, we can pull out what they need, and they can start doing their work, the geometry, sizes, loads. They can do their joist design, they design them a little differently, <coughs> sausage making. They can go ahead and put back in the model the bridging, connections, create the shop drawings, and their calculations for the joist. And then we can bring that back into our model. It's continually being developed with the other parts, the structural steel, connection, things like that. Bring it back in. Now you have the exact choice. And there's a number of benefits that can come out of that. We'll hit that in a minute. So is it fair to say, Jared, they're populating the model information that we're delivering. <coughs> Not something that you necessarily do in Revit, where you're doing maybe Revit to Revit coordination on the design side. Here you're delivering a model that somebody else is able to actually iteratively populate, and then you're bringing it back downstream. That's the that's really difference here. Yeah, well we put in a generic choice so we don't know what the webs are going to be like and through their process down here, they, they take them out, do their design, and then put in the real choice. So they're populating with the, the exact choice. Jared, where are you handling procurement at? Right after the control and building model? Is that where you're trying to get your procurement of the choice or the yeah. steel? Choice. Well, <laughs> the, the whole bid process for Joyce has remained the same. It could, it could be off 2D. Okay. Um, a lot depends on um, your goals on that specific project too. Mm -hmm. right. If you know, if, if it is a speed market approach, and the client needs to start fabrication as soon as possible to start making money, then the priority would move the procurement up from the steel joist scenario in that design process of you know DD level um, or end of DD such that you can procure the steel joist process down below at that time and not wait for the construction documents to occur. Okay. There'll be two examples that show you how we did that. And again, it's a, it's a project by project basis. So what, what are the goals of the project? So th this particular project and Tony headed this one up um, for solar. This one was truly all the time. And so um, this is another example where we're not fighting against the steel fabricators. That Able Steel with the GSA, they were going after this project. They just had experience with MBJ and LTC about the GSA project. They asked us to come on their team and to sell our services 
to help secure the project for them, and we helped them do that. And so the steel fabricator had us as a sub to them, not as an engineer record, but as an integrated um, engineer and detailer. And they also had the Joyce manufacturer on board already. So <clears throat> however they chose that Joyce manufacturer, I, I don't know, actually, in that case. New money. We just finished the target. We were actually, we helped select that from the target experience six months prior. And uh, knowing New Millennium could do this process with us, and it was tested, uh, we influenced Able in choosing them over a bulk of So the, their performance based, and who knows where the numbers were at, though, really. Correct. So we also participated in the interview to m and with Able and with Shane, describing this process as a differentiator about how they would open this building on that. M and W being the engineer of record. M and W being the, um, I guess, the representative of First Solar to build it. McShane was the general contractor. I guess you'd say M and W was the construction manager. So there's some more stats that Tony probably know, but uh, the, the modeling in, in tech and rubber steel detailing started at the same time they're at schematic design phase for design. So it's basically like, you know, are the, are the grids set? Okay, let's go. Well, the grids, of course, weren't set. They still move, but we adjusted as we went along. And so the, it took four months from that schematic design that I just talked about to this level, about this level of construction, 400,000 square feet, fully constructed in debt. I don't know what the overall... 1.3 million square feet. And it's the largest open space that's not producing any solar panels right now in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> Huge success. Yes. Um, but so I, mean, solar oil, yes. I mean, the, the steel contract was uh, about $10.5 million to begin with when we were going through it. We got it down to about nine point two for steel through this process. Uh, some of the benefits of what occurred, and we worked with Baca Nolfi as the engineer of record on this, is a lot of pipe hanger situations or pipe rack situations hang off joists. Typical or uh, the way New Millennium would design them, the Bullcraft would design them, you get a conservative approach on those joists, <coughs> pipe belts. And so what we did is an exact load and we were able to remove a bunch of tonnage over 1.3 million square feet by doing that in this process and giving them digital point loads so that they can enter into their programs at a more uh, I guess faster pace design uh, during that process. So it, we learned a lot on that project as well about what our joy suppliers could actually do. They learned a lot about what they could actually import in from a digital or big data scenario. So this was a really fun project that we all learned a lot on. It was a success. This shows an example. It's not me as clear as I want here, but. Um, we showed you the different web orientations that you don't know where they are initially, but once we brought the true webs back here, we started coordinating them with pipe hangers, we could certainly see the conflicts at that point. And so we started adjusting and making different type of connections in the model instead of on the field, um, which isn't done hardly at all these days um, using the true um, joist. So here we use the additional bolt holes and just move the bolts out here. The other thing that's we call it a federated model that's interesting here is, oops. So we, we do all our detailing modeling in Tecla for, from a detailing standpoint, steel fabrication standpoint. Um, the biggest competing product around here is called SDS2. So you might be 50 50 market share. And so the fabricator, Able Steel, who likes working with the time, they use internally SDS2, and they, are, they model all the piping material themselves, again, to kind of divide and conquer. What we can do, of course, is, is bring things together in one model through IFC or other things like that and, and collaborate. So no job is exactly the same, but uh, with these tools, they're interoperable, so you can speak to each other and, and work through it. And this just shows another example where this doesn't look that ideal, but you bring in the, the top cord of this 
true joists versus the uh, assumed joists, and you find out how big the angles are and how big the spacing is between. And there's a conflict with a stiffener. So within the model, not all in the field, you're able to, you know, draw down the stiffener. In this case, I'm sure we we pushed and asked the engineer right for the sign off on this uh, prior to moving forward through an RFI process, but in the model. We were in model review there. There was no paper drawings at all. And uh, <coughs> The contractor in the chain did not build it off of any of the construction documents. Everybody there built it off of the virtual model. Um, before I move on, did you want to take a break and see if people need to sit? Yeah, is anybody seat? thirsty? I, I think the Northwoods room is open. But if not, we can keep going. Feel free to jump out and jump back in. Any general questions or comments at this point? Are those Jewish uh, models uh, Revit compatible? So how would we integrate that into our model? Yeah, so we did that. I thought I had Target in here, but we did this with Target um, that we brought back through, I think uh, through IFC. So it being the most common format that's being used these days. There's still a couple bugs in translation, you know, from Tecla, Revit, and IFC. Kind of, kind of comes to like intrusion. So you can bring these. Um, Something that has geometrically accurate to pull it back into Revit, but it's, it's not maybe quite as easy to manipulate. But it can certainly be geometrically indicated and displayed in your documents and shows. The target was looking at utilizing this space here. For most of the target stores, you know, they just plan all mechanical, each back, just go down here and not deal with it. But they're starting to ask themselves, well, can we cut some height out of our building for at least have a collar parapet so it'll look the same and bring down the mechanical costs, cooling costs, and use a space within there. It is a, that, it's an excellent point. When, you're, when you start to get into that level of detail, you can start saving the wall height or the exterior enclosure costs, manufacturing facility, you know, and Z and metal siding, maybe it's not that all expensive, but we've saved about 14 to 16 inches uh, off of that entire perimeter. Um, just by going through and having the actual joists and that's that. On the first solar. On the first solar. One, one comment about Tecla is a very light modeling platform, but it's very accurate. So if you have a coke, a cut, a bolt hole, erection hole, it's all in the model, it's all there. Whereas in Revit, if you put a bolt in, you start to really weigh the model down. So one of the things we're thinking about how we can utilize these tools, we want to show something accurately, or something ornamental, it's actually a great tool to do that, and you can then play that backwards. Uh, Revit. In the case of the Riyadh tower we mentioned, that was solely done both from a fabrication drawing and any construction document drawings in Tecla. Yeah, there are two tools of choice of Revit on the upstream, design bid, and Tecla on the downstream. They certainly talk. From an RFI standpoint, uh, I'm working with Shuffle Project right now, using but using Tecla to model of the whole facility. I don't know how you would ask that question in RFI you know, during the study process of the FC centers on the end of the beam that we, we might need to shorten because of the joy seat issue. Those pictures are worth I mean, hours of time savings on the course yeah. of the project. Well, that's what we do. Yeah, we take snapshots and point to them, create a PDF or a 3 d PDF. But what we've been pushing on a number of these jobs is just doing a full in model review process. So you get the engineer record, if we're not the engineer record sitting in a room with us, walking through the critical areas of the building. If the, if the 3D model is going to generate the shop drawings, why not do a review in the 3D model first before you generate the shop drawing in order to validate its completeness and accuracy? Here we go, in model proof of shop drawings. <coughs> so this is an example on a federal project um, in Hawaii that we did just that. We are not the engineer of record. Um, we did the shop drawings. Uh, we did not do the connection design either. It's purely coordination, um, integration with the design team. And in this case, I think they're down in Burns and McDonald down in Kansas City, I believe. So during the primary point when we had 90, 95 percent of our connections in there, we sat down with their engineer of record and course of three or four days walk through all the hot spots in the model and, and took notes, put notes right back in the model 
sent the model back. And we ended up going through this thoroughly enough that they um, signed off on the model as, as approval instead of shop drawings. And the shop drawings were sent as record. And the federal government allowed it. So that was a big step we got on this one. Um, bidding from bill of materials. This isn't done as much uh, because of the, the issue of competitiveness um, opportunities. But there are conditions where you, uh, you want to get down to the degree where you're literally handing over some shop drawings for bidding. So this is um, TARC in Southern California, where again, we uh, target internally was engineer record. We came on as an integrated uh, engineer and detailer on this project. Uh, with the joist, we went through the same joist process that we described before. And, and one thing that was interesting I'll point out is that the, the joists don't get designed, like we said, truly designed until they're given over to the manufacturer. And in this case, uh, when they went through the design of some of these joists, uh, the, the bearing seats, because of the special loads they had on, came out deeper. And what that was going to do was going to push down the girders on this line uh, of columns here. And because the target is so set with, with everything in, in their processes, that was not going to fly. <coughs> you, at this point in the game, you could not drop a whole girder because of uh, heaven height. So in lieu of that, they actually went to two joists instead of just having a deeper joist seat, which a lot more material, but it took care of that, the headroom issue. And this is all done in the mile ahead of time. The thing I want to point out is it's not that big of a deal, but these two joists, as you can see, are sitting on, on double stiffened um, connector. Beyond here is, is the precast, or in this case, tilt-up walls. The tilt-up walls and these embeds had not been bid yet. So this is just a small example that um, when these walls were bid now, they were bid with the updated embed and, and the steel to go along with it. And you got a, a first competitive cost on it versus uh, additional cost later on that was probably not at market rates. This was an unusual way of going about business, I'll say, as far as how we procure things. And it's driven by Target. This was, they wanted to have some test cases to see how some of these processes work. So before they hired a fabricator, the first thing they did is they hired the Joyce manufacturer off the permit set. So they go all wait, like I said before, wait till CDs. The joists are pretty much set at the permit level. And in California, they're expecting uh, four weeks, I think, or, or more for review from, by the permitting agency. So we had time, secured the joist manufacturer competitively. And then within three weeks, we had approved joist shop drawings in the model. So. We handed them the digital model, they did their work, brought it back, they did a model review, they picked up any comments, and within three weeks, the joists could have been fabricated and ready to go. So you, that's a pretty interesting case study probably, that you probably don't hear. So if you're in a jam for joists, <laughs> this is definitely the way to go. After that, uh, we brought the joists in and did further coordination with things like UBIT, like we showed you. And because the structural steel in this building, as you can see, it's primarily, there's not a lot of it. There's two columns with cap plates and base plates. There's some other, you know, miscellaneous steel beam over here. Um, rooftop units have some channels. There's not a lot of fabrication options. You know, you give it to the fabricator, you put a cap plate on, you put a fill well around. There's not a lot of options for them to have a competitive advantage. So this is the one case that makes sense to go all the way down to fully detailed shop drawings and bid the shop drawings with the model. So, so that's what we did. Um, we went through a in-model review process with Target and got all the shop drawings cleaned up. And when we went to bid for the structural steel, for the steel fabrication selection, we gave them a bill of materials, every nut and bolt, basically. We gave them the, the technical model and it, anything you could export to, and the design drawings. and then. If something was missed by some reason, we also gave them uh, a list of unit prices that they had provided. And if anything changed for architectural reasons beyond that. 
So talk about an apples to apples comparison. One of the fabricators brought in the Tecla model, applied their labor rates to it. Within a couple hours, they knew exactly their cost. Now, what that fabricator chooses to bid is another thing. You know, is their shop slow? How bad do they want it? But this is a case where you could, yeah, you're, you're taking away um, ingenuity, let's say, the different fabricators, and it's down to what, what they want it for. At what point in that diagram did you come on board? Maybe I missed it. <coughs> Way back here. So the, the permit set in September, we're on board probably middle August. And they handed over the, the 2D set of CDs, or they did something in Reddit? 2D, 2D permit set, set of permit set, yeah. And they had new PDFs and you went to town from there? They probably gave us a Revit as well. And we've, we've converted from Revit to Teclo before and then do a little bit of cleanup. Okay. You're kind of going from design BIM to construction BIM. And I forget exactly what we did on the job. I wouldn't doubt that we started from scratch. So yeah, we were on board back here and able to give the Joyce manufacturer something early September. Um, this is fair to say though too though, we start from scratch or we adapt a model. The content that's in the model has to match the content of the city draw. And that's still like a legal document that occurs. It is to that at that point, but as you progress as you know you, within a model you go detailing you get more of your farming. And so the model starts taking over. So in this case, that's basically what happened. So as we're moving through the process in the shop drawing, they're updating their design drawings to reflect. Target was on board though. <coughs> yeah, the value that they were providing or like to assume that right. risk. And that's something that you have to decide, well, what is the risk? And it may be that the risk is relatively low given the value that you can be provided with because you're dealing with information that the construction can model. What we, what we do is we're an engineer record and doing the, the shop drawings. And at any point we'd go to the construction model, that would be our model. We would export back into Revit or, or whatnot to do our collaboration. But we went, once we start the modeling, we went try to run two models in parallel. I don't think that makes sense. When I think that another piece that is really important is the communication level that occurs. When you have a source, so let's say we're, we are an engineer of record, and you have a fabricator, and you're bridging the gap kind of with these stick models or techno models or shop drawing construction models. What you're really doing is involving kind of that project man or manager or structural engineer that was involved on the front end as well as the back end to really communicate quickly. And you remove, and we found this in GSA, you remove a lot of that RFI process. It's instantaneous when you, when you convert into that model that you're updating all of those issues and you're essentially dispersing the communications going back out to the team. These are the updates. This is what's happening. You've got team meetings, conference calls, or a WebEx describing these are the complications that occurred. It's not a process of handing off necessarily a traditional RFI feed that comes around into the fabricator or, or even down to the steel joist guy and then back around in this process. It is instantaneous back and forth uh, driving an uh, driving answers and then documenting. Uh, you don't you don't cowboy this and just all of a sudden do this. You have to document and have that process down to be successful in this. Otherwise, you know everybody will kind of forget about what, how decisions were made or through that process. So it's still a, it's still an RFI process. It's just much quicker. In Tecla, like Revit has parameters to use use of design components. Tecla has capability to document this RFI process through the database. So you can actually track it through the model. So we're gonna transition from structural steel to light gauge for full form. I'm gonna show you an example of um, integrated detailing for this. Um, as MBJ, me and the engineer record, we've also transitioned doing shop drawings and design for um, some contractors like like gauge. So we can do the engineering calculations. Um, usually, like gauge is a delegated design uh, piece of uh, the contract. So for an exterior wall, the engineer record is usually saying, um, you know, design. Here's the wind pressures uh, between the architect and the engineer. You're usually saying this is the stud depth. You've done an 
enough analysis, you know, like six inch or eight inch. You might say a minimum gauge from a long term um, protection standpoint, but you don't get into the exact flange sizes or even the spacing <coughs> where you need to double them up at headers and things like that. That's just traditional. That's nothing new that we're doing here. That's just traditional light gauge. Um, and for four systems, it's, it's pretty similar as well. Um, so we started creating uh, 2D shops some time ago. Oops. Um, then we've been pushing into um, a 3D BIM construction model. So just like structural steel, now we're getting to that level of light gauge. Um, panelization is, is becoming, in, in modular design, is more popular these days. It makes a lot of sense to speed up the project, whether the panels are built on site or off site. This lends itself towards that. And then integrating light gauge, a lot of times there is structural steel within the model. I'll show you an example of that. So this first one is um, a phase where we're partially there um, as far as a 3D modeling standpoint where we're the engineer record for this building. We have the Revit model. And so we're able to model exterior studs, but correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, is we probably model basically the like a, a, just a thickness for the wall, the inside face and the outside face. But I don't think we modeled every single stud with the clips. There. Correct, yeah. We gave a performance design as the engineer of record for the exterior facade, delegated that as a deferred submittal process, and then DPR asked us to perform the, um, the self-performed light gauge. They asked us to produce the calculations, deferred submittal, and shop drawings. So, we designed, used our actual structural model, Revit model, and then cut 2D shop drawings in a calculation package for that on this project. And we've done that for DPR on a couple projects now and a couple of subcontractors in that market. So it's probably the most common way or just traditional 2D like these jobs and calculations. Now this next job, we brought it a step further, probably to the nth degree. Um, this is called Gateway Senior Living Down in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is being erected right now. So, point I pulled this model, two of the four levels were um, modeled and detailed. Um, but here, instead of doing just the, the single thickness wall, we went ahead and modeled every stud, um, strapping, bridging, the place, everything except for the screws, basically. And in, in a fashion that you can drive the build materials out of it and create the 2D shop drawings. This, this building also had, you can see sticking up a little bit here, it had some brace frames uh, intermixed in it. And I think with, in the stair areas, they went structural steel around the perimeter for their steel stairs. So, you know, wood was not an option for the senior living building, they had to go not combustible. Uh, we were not the engineer of record. We were brought on for detailing um, of the light gauge and structural steel, and actually no design for the light gauge. This is a Revit model too, is it? Yes, this is a Revit model. So Revit has an add-on um, component software that you can purchase that helps you to do the shop drive and light gauge. So in, in this case, we had, we're he heading down the direction of rather for downstream. Uh, this is a few just images that you can see. There's a lot of integration from this is the top track, every stud, um, strapping, gusset, and then you get to the tube that sits on top. What you don't see here is the metal deck that sits on top of here. These studs were modeled, but they're, they're not meant to be shot fabricated, nor were these um, rebar or rod. Um, they're put in there for quantities and to show where they go, but the metal deck had to get placed first, weld in place, and then the studs. But the splices between the tubes, all that um, is fully modeled, and then a set of shop drawings comes out for structural steel. And again, uh, on this job, um, we push some in model review <coughs> and coordination with the general contractor and with the light gauge. Um, Director, but we did not push it to the level where the structural engineer record was um, going into the model and reviewing it. What they saw was 2D shop drawings. But 
but the level of coordination was there from the general contractor standpoint that they're very satisfied with how this would work, especially when it's a panelized job. Um, tolerance is very tight. So just a couple more shots. What you see here, it, it is tedious, um, but ultimately what you get is some shop drawings, an elevation here, and then for each panel, you get the panel break, break out with the size of the studs, the weights. And I think as this went on, we took an overall weight for this panel. So each one of these panels had a, a tube across the top. We had to determine where the splices were with the, the people who were doing the erection. And then this piece was lifted up. And I guess that's the only engineering we did. We had to design the connection between the light gauge and the steel tube for the erection, for lifting it in place, because that was a temporary load. So this is a summary. I have a few more slides, but this is a summary of what we just talked about for the five different services. And how we're pushing, uh, not just being the engineer record, but also being the, doing shop drawings and modeling at the construction model. Next few slides here just get into some areas that we've started um, getting into partially. Uh, we think there's some opportunity in the future to continue on. So for floor systems, this is a job we worked on where they did erect uh, a whole bay of joists together with the bridging uh, in one lift, pod by pod, so they could build them um, right next to the site. I think they stacked them up and then quickly bring them into place again at speed up time. Um, and then on another job, we went a step further and put the metal deck. You'd have to decide at what point it makes sense to bring in HVAC or metal piping Things like that. Jared, we're, we're uh, doing a project for Fort Lewis, Washington right now where we're lifting up uh, two wood roofs uh, on top of their uh, barracks. And so build up the walls and one simultaneously building the entire roof, roofing it, adding all the piping, ductwork, et cetera. And so they can build those simultaneously and then do one lift. And so we're designing the rigging and the lift system for that roof to be put, on, be put in place and then final connections. So BDC uh, integrated modeling and detailing is all, allowing more opportunities for modular panelization. <laughs> um, this is not uh, one of our jobs, but just this is an example of what's happening in the industry is building pods for housing or hotels. Um, you've probably seen some of that going on. Uh, this is a project that we are um, bidding with one, a steel fabricator that it's a kind of like a control boot inside a manufacturing facility where they get down to the insulation, and all the electrical, everything, and just bring it out as a pod. And this is a higher end uh, residential unit, I think, fabricated, they make it in Wisconsin, called Flat Pack. And we started looking at a particular housing development where we'll use these. Uh, precast is another animal. Um, as you saw, it's a steel joist. The parts and pieces inside the steel joist vary by manufacturer. Things vary even more by manufacturer for precast. So that's what the challenge is for precast. Uh, we have gone, we, we've developed this. We took an existing project and said, let's just do some test cases. So we fully modeled this in Tecla, the embed, the rebar, the lifting lugs, everything as an example. And we've been talking to local uh, precasters about using a more integrated and fully modeled approach. They, they don't use 3D modeling to this level locally. Um, what, what seems to make sense initially here is that with precast is the deliverable that you could give that would make sense would be the faces of the walls, the, the windows, the rough openings, the reveals, um, and the joints, but not the innards of the panels. Those vary by the different manufacturers. So I think in the future that makes sense to be a deliverable. It's something we'll be looking at. We do have some experience with, you know, in Phoenix market, site has built up is a viable option and we have utilized some level of this modeling in that application. Yeah, in the GSA column, um, we did all the modeling of the exterior walls on tilt up in exactly that scenario. All the reveals, the joints, 
rough openings and handed that over to SunTech then who did the mild reinforcing rebar in those. You don't produce the panel work there, so someone else then? We can, actually. Okay. Uh, it's something we've been developing. Okay. But uh, you know, two years ago, three years ago, we weren't at that time. So okay. we could get the, the thickness, the joints, and all those other fun things worked out. And then we just let them detail the rebar. Right. Lifting inserts and other things, we've been doing that now for a couple firms uh, down in the Phoenix area as well. It's kind of opened our eyes a little bit more, you know, everybody's learning, but, you know, uh, learning the construction process and understanding each piece of it, we all get better at doing our jobs. Then.